We grow when we give. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. Nosotros crecemos cuando damos. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. Welcome to ROG, Return on Generosity. I'm your host, Shannon Cassidy. This podcast celebrates generosity at work, not financial giving. Giving valuable time, mutual respect, alternative perspectives, and genuine collaboration. Our special guest today is Pooja Minha. Pooja is Executive Vice President and General Manager for Effective, the advertising sales division of Comcast Cable. Pooja oversees the company PL and a national team spanning all sales and sales department, operation, technology, product, data innovation, and insights and customer experience. Pooja is also responsible for driving growth in addressable, multi-screen, and audience-based advertising. Before this, Pooja was Chief Growth Officer for Comcast Advertising. In that role, she led global marketing across the division, which includes Freewheel, a global technology platform for the TV advertising industry, and Effective, as well as Effective Sales Department function. Pooja is a leader who brings more than 20 years of experience in the media and advertising sector with a track record of transforming businesses, creating new and innovative models, developing brands, partnerships, and talent, and exceeding revenue goals. What I appreciate most about you, Pooja, is your ability to give thoughtful and quality feedback. We met as a result of a coaching engagement with one of your direct reports, and your feedback was thorough, fair, balanced, authentic, and generous. Welcome to ROG, Pooja. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being here. Oh, I love having you here, and I can't wait to dig into this conversation. Why don't we start off with a little bit of your background? So uh, if I go all the way back to the beginning, uh, I actually grew up in the middle of nowhere in Canada. Uh, I was born, uh, born in Ottawa, but grew up in Saskatchewan, Canada. So nobody, I live in New York City now, nobody sees that coming. Um, and, but I, I've been in New York for pretty much my whole career. And I have been at a number of big media companies. I started my career in sales at Dow Jones and Company pre-Fox uh, acquisition or News Corp acquisition. Um, I've spent time at Viacom, now Paramount. Uh, back then, I think it was even MTV Networks underneath the Viacom. I've spent time at ABC and Disney. Um, and immediately before Comcast, I uh, oversaw an ad tech company called Truex that was actually a subsidiary of 21st Century Fox, then got bought by Disney, which was a weird round trip for me because that's where I'd come from, and then was sold to another company. And, and you know, it, was, it was after that transition was fully complete that I you know, left and came to Comcast. So I've been touring media companies. I spent my whole career, as you said, in um, ad tech, advertising, and media. Um, but the through line besides that is that I have been exploring each facet of the business. I started out in sales. And so at heart, I consider myself a seller and an outdoor cat uh, more than an indoor cat. But uh, what has been great has been learning each part of the business, which is what led me into general management. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for that background. And it's just so interesting how you have been collecting experiences and networks throughout the industry and how that has helped you to have this, like I would say, a rounder perspective on the business that you're currently running And I've had the opportunity to partner with you on. So I wanted to hear your definition of generous leadership. So first of all, I love the name of your podcast. Um, I think it's fantastic. And I love this concept of generous leadership a lot. I thought about this and I feel like generous leadership to me is the amalgam of a bunch of things. First of all, I think it's about thinking and caring about and considering the whole person. Uh, and coming from a place where you you always do consider that and care for it. Um, I think it's also as a leader, you know, when you, with your team, you, you give them context, you give them the why behind things so they can have that broader perspective so they can understand and fit their work into it so they can understand why things happen the way they happen and also so they can grow. And eventually when they have to have that broader perspective as part of their jobs, they're ready I also think it's not about saying to your team things like, you know, fix it or figure it out uh, or assuming that you as the leader always have to fix it and figure it out or that it's always on them. I think it's about being really collaborative and asking questions like someone brings me a problem. I always say, okay, well, do you have an idea of what 
what to do here or what are your thoughts on how we solve this? And sometimes they'll come with ideas and sometimes they won't. I'm going to say, that's okay. Let's figure this out together. And, and then it's not about me telling you what to do. It's about, okay, let me roll up my sleeves and let's figure that out you know, together. Um, I also think it's about being, you know, you, you mentioned how we met, but I think it's about being really, you know, helping people be better. And one of the fundamental ways you do that isn't just encouraging them. It's giving them clear, honest, and fair feedback, but from a place of real caring, caring about the business and the person, right? I want both to be great. Uh, and the more I help this person be great, the bigger an impact they're going to have in their career and the bigger an impact they'll have on the business we're in. You know, it's encouraging them and giving them the credit away, giving them opportunities to shine, maybe giving them an opportunity they wouldn't have had. Um, so I think like all those things. And the, the last thing is I think being really vulnerable with people, which is something I didn't figure out till later in my career and be honest with them, mostly so that they feel comfortable being vulnerable and honest too. Because you, you, you take your cues from your leader on that. So if I was going to sum all of that up, because I know I gave you a really long list of things, I think in a nutshell, it's honesty, it's transparency, and it's giving and creating opportunities for others. The opportunity to be better and grow, the opportunity to get the job or the exposure that you weren't going to otherwise get. Sometimes, you know, generous leadership is, is taking a risk on talent because you see something and you want to create that. I think it's showing people that big picture and I help think it's about helping them to bring more of themselves into their work, which has, in my experience, only ever done good things for those people and great things for the business that they work on. Mm, so beautiful. Oh my gosh, that was that was a fantastic answer and so comprehensive and really gets me thinking about so many different things. So curious to hear about an experience that you have had with a leader in your past where you've seen any of those things demonstrated. So I have been incredibly lucky. I mean, one part of generous leadership, I think, is you want to continue to pay it forward. People have been mm-hmm. incredibly generous to me over my career. Not everybody, but but certainly many people. And it really had such a profound impact on me in terms of what I learned and the whatever success I've enjoyed is very much because of the generosity those people practiced with me. So I was thinking about a couple of people that really just stood up in mind or even episodes. And one was going all the way back to the start of my career. Oh, I was an account executive and I'm, I mean, I was beyond clueless. I was in sales and I was, I was really new and just trying to figure out what I was doing. And this is back in the day when you actually mailed media kits to people. I was in print uh, and you mailed, you know, thoughtful letters to them. This is a very different time. And I was trying, I was covering someone else's desk as well as my own. That person was out on medical leave. And I had all of these media kits I was trying to mail out to all of these prospects and customers in time to hit, you know, have enough time to follow up before the, the, the issue closed, the sales deadline. And I had all my letters and I had all my materials and I was customizing each box and it was just a ton of stuff. And I had all the materials. I just needed to now assemble all of them and write out the zillion FedEx slips that this was going to require. And I mean, that's, I mean, that, that's not fun work. It's just work that has to get done. And I was sitting there in the office, we had an open plan office for, you know, sellers late writing out, you know, my hand cramping, writing out the FedEx labels and, you know, putting all these things in, in packages. And our, you know, one of our directors was walking out and she said, what are you doing here? And so I said, oh, this is what I'm doing. And I explained what I was up to. And she looked at, she goes, whew, that's a lot. Got a lot of packages to mail. I'm like, I do. And she's like, well, why don't you come in tomorrow? And I'm like, well, I really want to get them out first thing because this is the deadline I'm trying to hit. This is why this matters. And I put all this work into writing these letters and customizing them. I don't want to blow it by not giving enough time. And so she looked at me and she goes, you're going to be here for ages. And I was like, yeah, you know, what are you going to do? And without saying a word to me, she turned around, went back in her office, called her husband, said, I'm going to be late. And she came back out there, took off her coat and just sat there and wrote FedEx labels with me and helped me assemble those packages. And it was so generous and it was just so thoughtful. And it, it was a little thing, but it meant the world to me because first of all, she was very senior. She was like up in the reporting line. She did not need to do that. It, but she was like, you put all this work in. I don't want you to blow it either. And not only that, I don't want you to be here too late. And it was showing me that, you know, she could roll up her sleeves and get involved. She could really, she was not above that in any way and that she wanted to help me succeed. And it was just kind. Um, it made a big impact on me. Uh, and probably because I guess that maybe wasn't what everybody else was doing. <laughs> yeah, right. But it really stood yes. out. I was like, wow, you know, senior people, they're just like us. Yes. Um, 
so that was one thing that stood out. You know, the next thing is, um, you know, sometime later when I got into my first management job, sales management, same company, a lot of changes. Um, I had a boss come and she was brought in from overseas to lead our group. And she came in and of course, you're always trying to find out what's the story on the new boss. And all everybody would say is, oh, you're going to like her. And what is that? I was like, why? And they're like, well, because she's very fair. And then that's all they would say. And I was like, what does that mean? And she was a known star inside the company. And so she came in and I will tell you, we were all terrified of her. She was Irish. Turns out later, she's the warmest person. She has the most wicked sense of humor. But we didn't know that at first because she was so smart. She really understood the business. She really understood what was going on. And she called us all out. She would ask the hard questions. She would point out to you if you didn't do something right. She would tell you how to be better. But the thing is the way she did it, which was her authentic style, but the underlying impact on me was it was fair. It was in the moment. It was actionable. It was specific. And it was generous in that she was never mad at you. It was just like, I'm just trying to help you be better. And it was always done from a place of caring and it worked. And I got so much better working for her. I had other people that told me what a great job I was doing, but at a certain point you cap out on what you can learn without somebody showing you the way. And she did that for me. And it taught me a lot about the kind of manager I wanted to be as well as it actually helped me get better. So I got better as a manager under her because of that experience. And I think she taught me more about that than anybody I've ever encountered. And I'm so grateful. And it's nice that she's been a friend for life. And I get to tell her that whenever I see her. Yes. Uh. Um, So that was one. And then the third was I had another boss who she cared about the whole person to the extreme. If you had a job interview with her, if you had your one-on-one and you came in with a list of things about the business you wanted to go over, because she was very busy and overseeing billions of dollars and had a ton of things to do. So you were like, I got to make the most out of my half hour with you. It was always going to start with, you know, if it was the interview, tell me about where you're from. Tell me about your family. Tell me about your life. Tell me about what's important to you. Then we'll get into the business. And if it was your one-on-one, she was always going to make sure she asked me, how is this going? How's that going? How are you feeling? How are your parents? She always checked in on the whole person and she remembered things about that person and integrated that very much into the way that she looked out for you, whether you told her it was, hey, I really want to learn this someday. She would never forget that. She'd circle back to it. If you told her, I, I, I really like chocolate cake. I had a colleague that did. Every time we went out for dinner as a team, she was like, and we'll get the chocolate cake for Rick. Like it just was such a generous, just down to the little things. She really, really cared. And she showed us she cared. And she brought that back to us in ways that were big and small and the ways that were about the business and that weren't. It was really special. Mm. Oh I'm my really gosh. Lucky. Thank you for those stories. Yeah. Well, and observant and affected by these inspirational people because I've seen you demonstrate those very things. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on, you know, yeah, you appreciate them. That was great modeling for you. What are some of the things that you're really intentional about as a leader to model some of those, like you said before, pay it forward, ways in which you look for that ripple effect of that generosity? So, I mean, in terms of like paying it forward, I mean, first of all, I do my best. I strive to make time to pay it forward. Um, I spend a lot of time with um, organizations like She Runs It and the IRTS, mentoring young people in our industry. Uh, I find it incredibly fulfilling and educational. And again, it just feels like the the right thing to do, um, given how many people have done that for me. I also, just inside of my own organization, try and create time for conversations, structured ones and unstructured ones. I have a tendency to be very like, get it done. That is that is my nature. And I'd like to move quickly. And one of the things I have, I've had to be intentional about is actually slowing down and making time for those other conversations. Um, you know, the boss I was telling you about that really t- took in the whole person, one of the early pieces of feedback she gave me was, you need to slow down. Your colleagues really need to get to know you. They want to get to know you. And you need to get to know them and let them get to know you. And I'm like, oh, I took them all out for lunch when I arrived. Isn't, isn't that enough? Mm-hmm. And she said, no, it's not. She said, you need <laughs> to build trust and you need to build a relationship. And the only way you're going to do that is if you slow down and make the time. And she was 100% correct. And slowing down to speed mm-hmm. up was how I would describe that. So I, I have gotten to be much more intentional about that. And then the, the last thing is like on the talent piece we tend to hire often with very limited imaginations or like we're mitigating risk. We're like, 
what would fit perfectly in this box or what came before it and filled this role? And let me go find something exactly like that and put it in. Or if I have a team of people and everybody's like, if they were shapes, everybody here is a triangle. Let me go find another triangle to match with all my other triangles. We tend to hire this way. And I think that looking out for talent and growing talent and being generous in your leadership is actually saying, what is it I really care about? And I can take a different package that that comes in. I can take a different background and I can take a chance on someone if they're bringing me the most fundamental things because the rest I can teach them. And I have definitely had people do that for me and it's helped me make leaps in my career. We have to be intentional about that, especially if we want to truly be committed to the aspiration of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Mm. Oh my gosh, absolutely. That beautiful segue and 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 stories and how you've been really intentional about how you're serving and leading others. I'd love for you to say a little more about the diversity, equity, and inclusion component of generosity and how everything that you've talked about lends itself to being a more inclusive leader. Yeah, I mean, inclusivity. I mean, first of all, I think mentorship and sponsorship is really, really important. You know, speaking up for people when they're not in the room, crediting their work, um, sometimes defending, you know, where, where a mistake was made or making sure that we don't just talk about what went wrong, we talk about what went right. That is a big part of sponsorship. But people always say, oh, it's the person that promotes you when you're not in the room. Actually, sponsorship sometimes is the person that defends you when you're not in the room. Uh, and that is really, really important, particularly with diverse talent. I think that that we need to speak up uh, for diverse talent because oftentimes they are getting judged through the lens of bias, even if it is deeply unconscious, it still can be there. So I think that plays a, a very fundamental role in generous leadership. I also think, again, taking the time to figure out how you grow people that work with you, not just to be good in their jobs, but to get ready for where they would like to go next or where you believe they have the opportunity to go next, whether they can see it for themselves yet or not. And again, that goes back to being willing to have hard conversations. And one thing that I, and I feel like I can say this as a woman of color, I think sometimes people are more careful about having hard conversations with diverse employees. And I think we actually do them a disservice when we do that. We are not protecting them. We are not helping them. That that is my opinion. Yeah, and I think the, and you're talking about why this is so important, and you even talked about starting with why in your opening comments. Yes, and even when you shared the FedEx story, the leader wanted to know like why can't you just do this tomorrow? And you explained the why, and then I think now you're talking about that sponsorship mentorship piece and. Why is it so important that we give everyone constructive, helpful feedback? It's because we want everyone to grow. And then there's a population of people who have been marginalized, who have not been privy to open, candid, helpful feedback. So I would say even more importantly, we need to prioritize how are we investing in individuals of all kinds and having those brave conversations with them having brave conversations and then also making brave choices. Like it goes back to what I was saying about hiring, particularly with diverse talent. You have to be willing to say, this person can bring a new perspective Mm -hmm. here. This person has a different kind of background, but that actually could really be additive. And they've got all the fundamental things and the rest I can teach them. Um, You know, uh, working uh, in advertising, particularly uh, when I've been in, in closer to the ad tech side, people treat this business like it's rocket science. It's a lot of concepts and it is, complex, but it's mostly a lot of concepts. And once you've got your head wrapped around those, you'll be fine. I fully believe with sustained effort, we can learn anything if we all want to. So I think sometimes giving people either the stretch assignment, the step up before they've demonstrated every single one of the behaviors, um, the opportunity to kind of shift to a different part of the business they haven't been in before and plant them in that soil and let them grow. Like you you, you need to create those opportunities and be bold and brave in, in in that sense and particularly with diverse talent, if we really want to change the workplace. Yes. And you just talked about behaviors, which makes me think of culture and what's normative and what is expected. And then, you you know, you were even talking about with that talent acquisition of trying to find someone who fits exactly into that little box, like, so that it just keeps going. Instead of saying, I, I think we need to disrupt or grow or evolve and innovate. I know you're responsible for innovation, so I'm sure that's a topic that comes up a lot. So I'm just curious to get your thoughts on how do you 
ready an environment, like a culture. I mean, as an EVP and general manager, right, this is now in your area of responsibility, right? Where you're thinking about how do I make sure that my organization is ready for some of this change? Because I want to bring in this new talent. I want to make sure we're really flexing and and opening our eyes to all kinds of possibilities. So what are some of your best practices or ways in which you're trying to evolve the culture? So the first thing is, I think we spend a lot of time being intentional about culture, thinking about it, and not just talking about, you know, caring and considering the whole person, but actually practicing that, you know, doesn't mean we always get it right or we make all the perfect decisions, but, but the intention is there and there's a real focus on that. The second thing is like, you know, there are nearly 3000 people that work at Effective. I have long passed the time and it makes me sad because I come from a small place in Canada where everybody does know everybody, where I can personally know everybody. And, you know, that's, a shame because I like meeting new people and it would be wonderful if you could get to know all the people on your team, but it's just not feasible. So I've long passed that. And so it becomes really, really important to be that much more aware that everything I do, that people will have the opportunity to see me do, the decisions we make, the language we use when we send out communications, the organization has to be really thought through because it's sending a message and it's setting a tone. The other thing I always think about is that the, you know, I'm not alone leading this organization. I have an incredible team of executive leaders, some of whom you know that work work with me and they are phenomenal each in their own right. And so the best thing I can do for the overall organization is help that team and those individuals be great as individuals and be great as a team. Because if they operate as a first team and they espouse the values that we say are at the core of the company, and they treat one another and then their directs and so on down the line um, in a way that is aligned with the culture we're trying to build, with the growth mindset we're trying to cultivate in everybody, um, with the generosity that we want to seed inside of our organization, then it's going to happen. So as much as I want to think about everybody at all times, and I love when I have opportunities to, to, to have skip levels and talk to people from all across the organization, I spend a lot of time thinking about how I make each of those leaders the best they can be? And how do I make them the best leadership team they can be? Because each of them, I've, I, I I know of other environments, not here where you can have a great leader, but they're at war with some other leader in the company, or they've got some tension between them. And that, that's not actually ultimately good for anybody on the teams underneath them. And, you know, we, we have, we do not have that here to be very clear, but again, how do we make sure that we are working as cohesively as we possibly can? Because that's setting a tone for how our teams will work with each other. Yeah. And that modeling that I'm hearing you refer to, right? You want to model the behaviors that you're talking about. You want people to prioritize their team members, their peers laterally. And, you know, going back to what you had said about one of your previous leaders who said, you know, invest in your colleagues, like spend time with them. They want to get to know you. So I I can imagine you do the same kind of coaching and encouragement of get to know each other, right? And build those strong bonds, learn about each other's business, empathize with how challenging it is, try to be lock armed, because it also goes back to something you said about doing it together. You've referred to togetherness, collaboration, helping each other, and helping each other starts with identifying that someone needs help (laughs) or having the willingness to ask for help, which most of us stink at, but for, for you to notice someone needs help and then jumping in and saying, Hey, you know, is there something I could do to help or what's going on? Maybe we could co-create a solution to this. So I just think all of that is, is culturally relevant, right? And so it starts with you and for you to cascade that down. And even like when you just said, we're not always going to get it right. That humility of saying, here's our aspiration, right? This is where we ultimately want to get to. We're not always going to hit it. But if you're also creating a feedback rich culture, which is unusual, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, You're trying. Right? Then then people will know when they're just nailing it and they're doing yeah. such a great job. And here's specifically what we mean when we say these behaviors. And then when they're not, and how, how, how do we hold each other accountable and hold them to a higher possibility, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, like I said, I go back to that, the boss I had that we were all initially terrified of. Like I was good at my job at that point. I wasn't great. And she was going to help me be great. He was going to teach me things that were going to give me the opportunity to be great. It might not always be things you wanted to hear, 
but who doesn't want to be great? Um, and, and again, especially when it's, it's not done with cruelty, it's not done with malice. It's not done in, in a way that is, um, in, in any way demeaning it's done with generosity. It's done with care and it's done with good intention. And that comes across and it's done, you know, then it really, you're like, yeah, I, I'd love to hear more about how I can do better. And, um, and then when I do it, when you recognize it, God, that feels good. So good. It really does. And then you see them growing because of the investment that you made, right? You see like, that's all they needed was that that nuanced tweak or just that bit of insight that they didn't even realize. I think for most people, they're really doing the best that they can. So it's on us to say, if you observe something that you think could be beneficial for them to work on and be aware of, like that, I think that that's the best way to be kind. Um, Absolutely. I mean, I will tell you over the years, like I've met so many people and one of the things that makes me happiest is like I go on LinkedIn sometimes and I love seeing these people that I remember from like way back when in their career and they're doing fantastic and exciting things. Like they're like, it's, it's nice that you've now got this mechanism that allows you to kind of stay in touch and ambiently watch someone grow. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's, I, I find that very, very uh, fulfilling. Totally. And you also talked about team and the importance of building a team, being one team, you know, unified. What are some of the ways that you have seen generosity demonstrated in teams, like highly effective, high performance teams? So, I mean, the first thing is, you know, uh, deciding that your first team is going to be each other. This is a concept that, um, you know, one of my one of my colleagues, uh, my HR business partner, she she really kind of verbalized it for me first, but it's something I've understood innately before that, which is this idea that what often happens in companies is that the leader feels like the people that they are, 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 are most sort of like brethren with most invested in most close to most sort of like ride or die with are they're they're the team, the people that report to them. But when you get to sort of a very senior level organization, your first team, your sort of ride or dies that you have to have that with the people that are your peers. Yeah. Because all the people underneath you are actually best served when you have that. If not, you're just a bunch of federated tribes as opposed to sort of one coherent, cohesive company or unit that's all working together. And there's nothing in our business that isn't cross-functional these days. Everybody's stuff touches everybody's stuff, mm-hmm. whether it's upstream or downstream or cross-impact. It, it you know, there, nobody can be an island anymore and be successful truly, or they can be successful, but the company can't. So that's the first thing. If we all want to win together, it's realizing that. And and I, I think sometimes that takes people time to get comfortable with. The second thing is getting comfortable with the idea that your success is completely in these people's hands and you don't control them or their people. So you are going to have to work with them. And so building that trust, building empathy, being willing to solve problems together, being willing to, you know, own your mistakes or say, yeah, yeah that my, yeah, that's a mess. And that's, that's my team's mess. We have to fix that. Um, you know, and then, you know, being generous with someone when they're on the other side of that, mm-hmm. I think that's really, really important. And then also being willing to like educate your peers about your world. So I, I think those are things I've seen really help. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. And, 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 you know, again, going back to my, my boss so many years ago, taking the time to get to know one another so that when you have to have those vulnerable moments or you have to put your trust in someone else, or you have to work through a hard problem, you've got this well of goodwill and trust Mm. to draw from. For sure. And when you talk about trust, empathy, solving problems together, even owning mistakes, I mean, our ability to own mistakes is a component of being vulnerable and we're more willing to be vulnerable with people that we have a genuine relationship with. So it's not just like a nice thing to do. It's really a beneficial piece of how we build high performance teams. So I love that you prioritize that and really encourage people. The last one I'm going to say, because this is something that, again, people I don't think necessarily associate with generosity is being in a position where, and again, one of the reasons you build trust is for empathy, but it's also because you want people to tell you what they think. And you want to be able to say what you think, Mm -hmm. right? Groupthink is bad. Or if everybody is just too nice to say, I don't think that's quite right. Or I actually have another way I would do that. You're never going to get to the right best solution. And so the same way you need to invite diversity in the room, you need to invite different points of view into the room. And you can't unless you've built that up. Or it's really hard to get people there. You can have a really nice culture, but it doesn't necessarily make it an effective culture unless 
you can debate, disagree, um, discuss, you know, uh, and, and, you know, challenge one another in a way that it's respectful, mm. that is generous, that is focused on getting to a good outcome. And that comes from a place of like, we're in this together. We're trying to make it better. Absolutely. And I want to reference this article that you wrote in Broadcasting and Cable recently, and there'll be a link to that in the show notes. The title of it is Navigating Your Career in the Evolving Media Industry, something all of us need to read. And it was just like a, a something that just was organically, you were writing and you thought, ah, oh, maybe I, maybe this might be useful to someone somewhere. And, and the answer is yes, it's useful to all of us everywhere. Uh, but one of the points that you make in this list of things that we can consider is, I'm looking at item, item number 15, which is you wrote, being able to disagree with someone or critique someone openly, productively, constructively, and keep the conversation positive is a valuable skill. Find low stakes maybe even non-work-related things and ways to practice because there's no other way to get better. And that's exactly what you're talking about. I'd love for you to share more about how do we do that? Like when you're in a disagreement with someone and you actually have had the courage to disagree, because like you said, all the bobbleheads and everyone being in unanimous agreement is like fake harmony. So we've, we have the debate, we have differences of opinions. Now it's uncomfortable, like... In what ways can we maintain that positivity or fi- make that into a more productive conversation? I mean, it's hard. It's so nuanced, right? I don't know if there's like one thing you do, but I think th- there's a couple of things that come to my mind. One is you have to be not just making your points, you know, coherently, and cogently and all that. You have to be genuinely listening to the other person. You have to be asking questions that are challenging, mm. but because you want to understand or get to a better solution, not because you're trying to, I don't know, poke holes or knock somebody down. Right. And I say that, and you're mm-hmm. like, well, how do you ask the question that way? But really it's the intention behind it. And mm-hmm. sometimes I have told people, you know, it's actually good to even say things like, look, I'm going to ask you a question. This is how I mean it. I don't know if I'm going to choose the right words, but let me start with why I'm asking this or, and what it is, how it is. I'd like you to take the question, not how it might come out because I, I'm not sure how artfully to say this. And I think people will accept that and take it at face value. But if you just blurt out your question and it's pretty pointed and pretty harsh, they might be like, whoa, where's this person really coming from? So I think first is, you know, and acknowledging that this is a little uncomfortable, but, but here's why I am doing this. I think that's one. The second is genuinely listening to what they respond with and trying to think about their perspective here. And, and, and you know, again, the last thing I would say is when you leave that room, it's also not just how you have to come. How do you leave that room? Do you walk out and is your body language like, whoa, that was tough? Or you say, okay, this was a lot. Wow. Okay. We really got into it, but thank you. This was a great conversation. Here's what I'm taking away, or here's what I think we have to do next. Or you and I are still apart on this. I want to go think about it some more or follow up on some of the things you asked me and let's come back together but you make it very clear to them in the way you leave them that th- there's nothing personal about this, that I am not mad at you. I, in fact, I am grateful that we were able to have this conversation with one another. And you can thank people sometimes, or, you know, I have actually thanked people for disagreeing with me before. I actually like, I, I always sound like I have strong opinions. I love when people will debate with me. I will debate with you, but I, I, I like it. Like it's making my thinking better. Stimulating. Um, yeah. And I, I want people, I don't, I always sound like I, my husband says I, I have I have a tendency to speak with un- unfounded confidence. Like he's like, even if you don't know what you're talking about, you have this way of sounding like you know what you're talking about sometimes. And I, I never, I'm never sure. <laughs> and so it sounds like I have these strongly held opinions and I don't. Like I'm totally open to having my mind change more often than not. Mm-hmm. But people don't necessarily realize that because I can be a little declarative. So I've learned to say, please tell me what's wrong here. Tell me what's incomplete. Debate me. Mm. Give me the alternate perspective. I need to hear it. And it's something I'm working on is to actually go out of my way to ask for that more mm. so that people are very clear that, that that is welcome and needed in the room. So I guess it's, those are things I'm working on myself, but I would encourage others to try too. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What wonderful advice. And and that even that point about how you leave the room, I think is a, a key piece of it because you could just be like, ooh, that's over with. And you just want to like drop the mic and run. But to to thank them for the willingness. Yeah, right. to- in the moment, even if you're like, you, you leave, you can always send them a message later saying, Hey, that was a pretty intense conversation we had. 
I am really glad that you're challenging me Mm. because it's going to help me to get to the better solution. I know where you're coming from. I'd love to continue this, or I'm sorry, I got frustrated for a few minutes there. It's just that my team and I have been working so hard on this. And that was challenging to hear you, you know, where you were coming from, but I need to hear it. Mm -hmm. So less. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause then you keep the door open for future conversations and continual growth. I think that's just so helpful that very practical feedback and it's not or approach. It sounds like how you would also approach feedback. Is that true? Yeah, I think so. Like making it very clear the intention with which it's being shared, giving people an opportunity to respond to it, whether in the moment or saying, look, you may have, you may see this differently. I want to welcome you to come back and after you've thought about this and reflect and come tell me. Uh, And again, I think being, very clear about your intention, thinking about how it's going to land on that other person. Sometimes, you know, going back to the example I just said, if you acknowledge, I know you have worked so hard on this. I know this must be hard to hear, but here's why I'm saying it. It's just showing the other person that I, I am thinking and considering where you are coming from or how this must feel. I mean, it is not lost on me. Um, and, and here is why I'm doing this. It's because of what I want for you or because of what the team or the project needs. I, I think that that helps, especially if we're willing to to take each other at, faith, at, at our word. Mm-hmm. Yes. And I think a lot of that takes preparation. So that thoughtfulness about, you know, what do I want to share? What's relevant to the feedback that I think is most valuable to them? You know, where, what, what could I see improving or, and then even how could I help them? That's something I witnessed you doing is being really clear, fair, balanced, and that personal engagement of how you wanted to help facilitate their continual development. Yeah, as much as you tell someone what they need to do, if you can find a way to play a role in it and help, I think that's a good thing. Or if you can also make sure you make room to tell them what they, what, what in, in the same specific terms that we tell people what they can work on, we have to use the same specific actionable terms to tell them what they're doing well. Yes. Because when you say great job, like you're like, thanks. But when you say, I loved how you fill in blank. And then when this happened, fill in blank. That is so much more meaningful for people. And they're like, I think they're much more likely to be like, I'm going to do that again. Yes. Yes. And the impact of that was fill in blank, right? There was this yes, impact. Exactly. It, had a, it had a result, right? And then you're like, oh, okay, what I'm doing matters. We're all really good at doing that. You know, we're, we're, we're all work on doing that with negative feedback. I think we have to do the same thing with the positive. I totally agree. And the statistics on that are that we need to give six pieces of positive feedback to one constructive Mm-hmm. You know, and and not together, like that whole sandwich <laughs> thing needs to go out the window. So that just means we need to give a lot of feedback total. Period. Have <laughs> more more positive and constructive. Yeah. So good call to action. I love that. Um, just one last question is your return on generosity. Like where do you see the return or the benefits of generosity? Oh my gosh. So I, I so the return on generosity, it's almost like the return on D and I. Right. Yeah. So why exactly. do you do it? Well, one, because Frankly, it's the right thing to do. There's there's literally a moral imperative to do it. It's the right thing to do. It feels good. It it is deeply fulfilling. Um, but the second reason is it makes good business. The same way that diverse teams make better decisions, companies with greater diversity are more profitable over the long term. I think teams and companies that practice generous leadership are much more successful. When everybody is being led from a generous place and you have a culture of generosity, all boats rise. And not only is it a better place to work and more, you know, you want to be there yourself, but because everybody else does too and feels like they're growing and they're going somewhere together and they can bring more of themselves to work or that their workplace, yeah, their leader, the company cares about that whole person a little bit more, they do mm-hmm. better work. So there's a moral imperative, there's a business imperative that I think the return is is. So there. And then, like I said, it is fulfilling. I Like I told you, sometimes when I'm sad, I like go on LinkedIn and just see how people that I know are just crushing it. It brings me joy. Yes. Oh, that's so good. Oh, I love it. So I'm going to attempt to try to encapsulate some of our takeaway tips. I would say the number one tip is to listen to this again and take notes. 
But here we go. So one of the things you talked about early on was explaining the why behind an assignment or a feedback or uh, any kind of project or initiative. So start with why. You talked about being clear and honest and fair with your feedback. You shared about how we could ask people what they think or encourage them to share their ideas for problem solving and really try to get that in the room. Don't assume you know everything, right? So that humility of bringing other people in. Empathy was was woven throughout everything that you've talked about today. And then you talked about giving people exposure, opportunities, um, and and also defending them, like as a, as a uh, sponsor, defending them when they're not in the room. And then, you know, the, the bit about uh, listening and really caring, asking quality questions. Um, and then this, this link back to DE and I, which we know is hand in hand. It's, it is generous leadership. So making sure that there's seats at the table or that the table gets expanded so that everybody is welcome to participate. Anything else you would want to add to that, Pooja? No, I think, I mean, I think you've summed it up so well. I think, like I said, it is about giving and creating opportunity for others. And that opportunity can come through the literal opportunity you give them. It could come through the feedback that you give them that helps them get better, the context that you give them that helps them think more broadly, um, the kindness you give them and the care you give them that helps them, you know, feel comfortable mm. and feel cared for and themselves. So that unleashes their greatness. Like all those things yeah. are about giving and creating opportunities for others. Um, and so, yeah, no, I think you did a great job summing it up. Thank yes. you. Ah, well, thank you for sharing your precious time with us and all this great wisdom. I so appreciate you and look forward to continuing our friendship. It's my pleasure. Thank you again for having me. And um, I just love this topic. So really appreciate the opportunity to spend time on it. Thanks for listening to ROG, Return on Generosity podcast. Please help us grow by subscribing and reviewing us on your favorite podcast player. And for more information, visit bridgebetween.com. We grow when we give. We grow when we give. We grow when we give.